personally, uh, two passages, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 and Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Why don't you open to 1 Thessalonians 5.17, and we'll start with that, and let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity and privilege to come here. We thank you that we live in the age of grace. We thank you that we understand that, and we hopefully live in light of it. And we pray this morning as we open your word that your spirit would give us understanding, insight, and that we take these things to heart. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, you all know this verse. It's only three words. <laughs> Say, people talk about the shortest verse in the Bible, you know, Jesus wept. And I wonder... The verse before this is shorter in the number of words, but this is one of the shorter verses in Paul's epistles, I'm sure. Pray without ceasing. Now, you've maybe when you got saved, you read that and for the first time, and you wondered, well, how in the world does that work? And here I've been saved all these years, and I still wonder, well, how in the world does that work? Uh, obviously, you cease praying from time to time. You fall asleep at night. Any of you know how to pray while you're asleep? That would be a really good thing to learn how to do as a ministry of the Holy Spirit in some of these places if you could do that. That would really be something you'd be really a spiritual person then. Uh, so you need to come to grips with what it's saying, try to understand it uh, without ceasing, without intermission, incessantly, uh, all the time it's going on. It's an ongoing thing. The other verse I have here, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, it's uh, another pretty short verse. I like to get assigned a long verse. There's a lot of stuff in a long verse, right? <laughs> Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So you, you look here, it says continue in prayer. Uh, continue means to continue instant and continue steadfastly. You attend continually, give oneself continually to wait on something continually. And so you look at those two verses and you kind of think about what they're saying. And the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5 is really pretty much saying the same thing as this verse, isn't it? When you think about it. Continue in prayer. Pray without ceasing. This is, should be an ongoing thing that we have going on in our lives. Um, when I became aware of, I guess, maybe called the grace alternative thinking about things, I was kind of aware of some of those things for a long time, but when it comes to prayer and when it comes to how God is working in your life. Uh, you know, there's like a traditional bunch of people out there, Christian people, saved people. I think I'm pretty sure they're saved. And they have ideas about what it means, and they say things about what God is doing and, and whatnot. And I don't know about you, did you ever feel like left out? You hear people tell stories about this, that, or the other thing, and God's doing this, that, or whatever, and and you maybe felt left out, because I kind of did sometimes, that, you know, wow. And they would say something like, well, God told me. <laughs> and then I would wonder, how does that work, or why doesn't that happen? And I really wrestled with, with a lot of these concepts over time, because I had a traditional kind of thinking about it. I was kind of raised on that. And I guess I've changed my view and my opinion and my feeling about some of these things. And when it comes to prayer, and this verse tells you to watch, so if you're praying and it tells you to watch, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but what are you, what are you looking for? My, my view of prayer is kind of like this. Uh, prayer is a conversation with God. That's really what it is, right? It's you talking to God uh, on a basis of talking to a friend. <clears throat> I would say 
I mean, realistically, it's, I think, actually impossible to pray all the time. Because you can, I don't know about you anyway, I can only do one thing at a time. I mean, really focus on one thing at a time. You ask any woman during football season, and they'll tell you the same thing about their husbands, right? But it doesn't have to be football. It could be anything. If you've ever sat down to read a book, and people are talking to you, and you don't really, you know someone's talking, but you don't really know what they're saying. So, prayer is not about starting out like our Heavenly Father or some such thing. Uh, I'm not saying there's no place for that. There is a place for that. That's, that's a good thing to do that kind of thing. But that's not all prayer is. And I think, I think sometimes people have the idea, have the notion that that's what prayer is. Is where you just start out and you, you like introduce things like that, and then you go through this little formula of saying certain things, and then you get down into like the meat of your prayer, and, and you offer up things and ask for things and and whatnot. And I don't really think that's exactly what it is. To tell you the truth, I think it's more like this. Prayer is like taking a road trip with your best friend in the car. And your best friend is God. So you get in the car with your friend and, you know, maybe you say good morning, how you doing, you have that kind of, those kind of things you get out of the way, the niceties. And then you get in the car and you're driving down the road. And you know how it is when you have a really good friend that you're with and you have this conversation with them sometimes you can just sit and not say anything right and then when some thought pops into your mind that you want to say to them do you say like your let's say your friend is bill oh bill oh bill oh bill <laughs> do you do that no i don't <laughs> and some people think that that's what prayer is. And, but so here you've got, you're driving in the car and your best friend is God, right? So you have this ongoing conversation with God and you don't need to say, Oh God, oh God, dear God, dear Heavenly Father, every time you start a prayer, right? You're having a conversation with somebody and that person converses back with you here, right? So when the guy says, well, God told me, I've got this guy, this friend, he calls me, and he, I personally, you know, this is my personality, if somebody tells me something I don't agree with, I don't personally feel like I have to try to correct them every time they make some statement to me I don't agree with. I, I might, over the course of time, tell them what I think, and I've told this person what I think, but he's told me some of the most crazy things that this guy was trying to hurt him and then actually said he was trying to kill him. And I'm not even sure that was true, but in his, from his perspective it was. And, you know, they say perception is reality, and there's a certain amount of truth to that. If you think something is true and you're going to act like it's true, at least for you it is. He, he thought this guy was trying to hurt him, and then somehow he was delivered from this guy's a Christian, He's a grace believer, too. <laughs> and uh, he was somehow delivered and saved from that. And then this person got sick. And he actually told me, God made that guy sick because he was trying to hurt me. And I'm like, oh. and I've told him, you know, I don't really believe that. But he continues to say things like that. Now, see, that's not really... When you talk, when you have this conversation with God, that's not really what you're looking for. I don't think I would. I would if somebody did me wrong and then they got sick and something bad happened to them. I would never in a hundred years ever say God did that to that person because they were out to get me for whatever it was. I was just that's just really taking on a load of stuff you don't really know anything about. So you're in the car with God. And you're going down this highway called life. And 
life can be kind of bad sometimes, if you ever notice. So you have this conversation with God, and to me it's more like, prayer to me is more like when you have a thought about somebody, some situation, some circumstance, you just kind of give it back to God. And it's an instantaneous thing. So when he says, "Can you know, pray without ceasing, I really think that's kind of what he means, that there's this ongoing conversation that you have. Now, almost everybody today has the Internet, right? And probably most of you, if not all of you that have the Internet, have high-speed Internet. And I do too now. But for years, where I live, I had dial-up. Remember dial-up? And you'd go to go on the internet and you hear the phone doot, 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 and then you hear the and then it would connect. And then even once you were on, it was so slow that you couldn't do some things that you can do if you have a high speed connection. When you have a high speed connection, I go to my computer now and I sit down and the internet is there. I don't have to wait for access. I have access. And see, this is what prayer is. is. I think it's that instant access to God where you lay things at God's feet and you tell God things and whatever situation is happening. And that's really, I believe, what prayer is. Now, he says in Colossians 4, to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. So then, as I alluded to um, a moment ago, it says to watch. So isn't it like, aren't you thinking when he says to watch? Well, okay, what are you watching for? Wouldn't that be a natural question? Well, I think I think so. So... If you're watching, you know what they say about how God answers prayer out there in the traditional world, right? Christian world. God says yes. God says no. God says wait. Is there a verse in the Bible that would say that exact thing? No, no. No, there's not. So I wonder about that, and I kind of personally kind of reject that now, actually. And I was talking to this fellow about prayer, and he said it, he made a good point. Is he, when, when you talk to him, he didn't want to hear stories. He wanted verses. And I think that's a good point of view, don't you? Because everyone has stories. Even unsaved people have stories about God doing this or God doing that. And my friend saying that God made this guy sick because he had done something bad to him. See, that's not really, I think, what this is talking about here. I think it's, those things are kind of obvious, it seems to me. If you, if you prayed about something and then that thing came to pass in a way that was favorable to you, what would you say God's answer was to that? You would say, he said yes, right? Or if you prayed about something and it didn't work out the way you thought, you would say, God said no. And if you prayed about something and nothing happened, at least apparently nothing happened, then you would say that God said, wait. That's all practical stuff, I mean, but I don't really know that it really gets down to the heart of the matter of praying without ceasing and watching what's going on. And I'm thinking personally, you don't have to agree with me about this, I think that when it talks about watching, this is a much harder thing to see, is to watch how the Spirit is working in the life of the people that you're praying about. That, you need to really watch for that, don't you? Because that's not just an obvious thing. That's sometimes very not obvious. Uh, We all have natural bents. And desires, sometimes they're things that are contrary to God and what God would want. The Holy Spirit is working in conjunction with the Word of God in the life of the believer to change those things, is he not? Are you the same person that you were when you got saved? 
whenever that was. Can you see that there's differences in your thinking, your attitude, and your behavior, and all different things like that since you got saved? Now, you could tell me, probably all of you could tell me things that, in ways that you're different, and, and I hope that you can, because that's really what this is all about. You come to a thing, a week's conference like this, and the Word of God, you hear the Word of God, the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God, He ministers that in your inner man, so that you, that's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, about being transformed in your mind and being renewed in the, in the inner man, right? Because the inner man is renewed. The inner man can be renewed. Your outward man is just fading away. It's wearing out. It's, you know, that's not going to last forever. But your inner man, that's where the issues really are. And so when you talk about this kind of thing, I think you're looking for the fruit and the work of the Spirit in the life of a person to show them that no matter what circumstance or situation uh, comes into their life, that there's something positive even in that. And, I, and when we get to the end, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but look over at Ephesians chapter 1. And a while back, we did a, a series at our church called Praying the Prayers of Paul. And it would be, there actually is a book by that title. It would be a good, that's the name of the book, Praying the Powerful Prayers of Paul. I, I can't say that I would wholeheartedly endorse that book because there's things in that book I didn't agree with, but I'll say one thing that that book did is it went through all of Paul's epistles and identified every place where there's a prayer of Paul. And if you got that book and you read that book and you went through and identified in Paul's epistles every time Paul prayed about something and then you began to pray in that way, I think that might be a good thing for you. Then you would be praying like your apostle prayed. Most of Paul's prayers deal with spiritual things like this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of the call, hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Who is that? That's you. That's me. There's power. In it. You need that power in your life. I'm not talking about power to be healed. I'm talking about something that lasts forever. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? Wow, what kind of power is that? To take a man who was dead and bring him back to life. That is power. I said back home many times, if somebody rose from the dead, you should pay attention to that person. <laughs> that is a remarkable thing. Ephesians chapter 3, the same book. There was great power there, and God is using that same power in the life of you. For this cause, Ephesians 3.14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth, what does it pass? Knowledge. Wow. That ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. So what are you watching for? Here's what I think you're really watching for. You're watching for that 
those things to start working in your life and in the life of other people who are believers. That you really got to look for. Because, you know, we go through life and sometimes those things aren't really that obvious in how we live, are they? You ever have a bad attitude about something, you know? <laughs> we had a situation back home where there's a fella and he was kind of actually taking advantage of some things at the church and he had been asked, you know, to stop. <laughs> he, had, he was putting, storing stuff and, and he had been asked to stop and, you know, he wasn't. So when it finally came down to actually to get him to actually do what we wanted him to do, he had to be confronted kind of forcefully. And then the attitude of that individual towards certain members of our church board was very bad. And he seemed to be pretty reluctant to want to move away from that because he thought he had been offended. Well, people in the church might have thought they were offended or might have been offended by, you know, what he was doing. But that wasn't a thought in his mind. And those are the kind of things that, and I brought messages about, you know, harboring bitterness and resentments and those kind of sins. I mean, when you, when you get saved, you've been kind of a reveler. Some of that stuff kind of naturally just fades away, but and everybody knows that stuff's wrong, but it's these emotional attitude sins that those things, we kind of like those things. And we, we actually nurture them sometimes, don't we? And that's the stuff God's looking to change. You, none of you have any of that kind of stuff going on in your lives, do you? You're all spiritual giants. <laughs> Look at in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. He says, For this cause I also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See, those are the things, and it's not talking about, should I buy a blue car or a red car? Or should I get a house, or should I buy this or buy that? Should I take this job or that job? And, and though, you know, that's not what the will of God is. The will of God is learning to adjust your thinking and attitude to the way God thinks and his attitude. That's really what the will of God is. Understanding Pauline truth, that's the will of God, too. Uh, the famous verse in Philippians chapter 4. Everybody knows this verse, right? Obviously, life brings, just by its very nature, all kinds of cares and concerns, right? And he says, let your, verse 5, Philippians 4, verse 5, let your moderation be known to unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You notice that thanksgiving again there? And that comes up pretty repeatedly, actually. But he says, be careful. Don't be full of care. Be careful for nothing. Are there things in life that would make you full of care? Yeah, exactly there are. You know there are. Uh, but you, you give those things to God, and it doesn't... Actually, he said, I'm going to get in trouble right now. It doesn't really matter how those things turn out. It really doesn't matter. Because whatever happens is good. <laughs> Even if you think it's bad. Right? Because you don't really know. And here, it's a funny thing. Here's what I'm going to get in trouble for. If... <laughs> If you pray about something and it turns out the way you want, people say God did that, right? But let's say you didn't pray about it and it turned out the same way. So now you really don't know. 
You know what I'm saying? You really don't know what would have happened had you not mentioned that thing ever to God. And see, God already knows that you're concerned about that thing. And, well, how, how do you, how do you, you just can't say. And I'm not going to tell you that God did that thing. And I might actually tell you I don't think he did, but, you know. Be careful for nothing. That was a very dangerous thing, in my opinion, to say, to actually come out and say that. <laughs> Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he talks about, in verse 8, I really think verse 8 goes with verse 7, because see, you will not get the peace. Somebody said to me, they prayed about this thing and they didn't get peace. Well, you know what? It's not like magic. You say, okay, God, about this. I mean, if you're still worried about it, you're not going to have peace. That's just the way it is. That's why he says in the next verse, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. If you're thinking about your mess, you're not thinking about that other stuff, are you? And if you're thinking about your mess, you're not going to have the peace of God that passeth understanding you're just going to have your mess but if you start thinking about these other things in verse 8 where, where would you where would you go to find out about the things he talks about in verse 8 where would you go to find out about that stuff is there a book <laughs> see here's the book right here and if you focus especially on paul's epistles You'll be way ahead of the game. Way ahead of the game. <clears throat> so prayer is, I believe, more about what God is doing in, return, in the terms of your inner man than it is looking for God to do something in the world that would affect you in a favorable or an unfavorable way. And it seems there's a, I think I need to talk about this in the context of prayer, and that's the issue of fellowship. Uh, I think that fellowship, the idea of fellowship is, your fellowship with God is pertinent here. And I want you to turn to Isaiah 59, and, and you know what they say, that if you're in the context of this yes, no, Wait idea. They say, Did you confess all your sins? You ever heard that said? How many have never heard that said? How many have never heard it said you have to have all your sins confessed to get your prayers answered? See, you all have heard it. If you've been saved five minutes, You've heard that. <laughs> and here's a verse, okay? Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Oh. I'm devastated. There's a verse right there. That verse is telling me that if I have unconfessed sin, God's not going to hear my prayers. That's why I'm not getting that Cadillac I want. Actually, I'd be praying for a Ferrari. But there's this show I started watching with my daughter called Top Gear. Anybody seen that show? And I, I like cars, but I've kind of been out of the loop on that kind of stuff for a long time actually and they they have the most awesome cars on that show you know zero to 60 in three seconds what i would love to drive one of those cars how do those guys ever get that job 
They must have. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> well, what are you going to do about this verse? What's the answer to this verse? Here's the answer. There's a dispensational context you need to understand. See, and if you don't make that dispensational context, somebody could use that verse like a club on you. I have here a little thing I found on the Internet. Boy, it's amazing what you find on the Internet. You could ask my son. (laughs) This lady, this is a question and answer type thing. This lady says, I pray regularly, but sometimes it seems like God's not listening. Why doesn't he answer my prayers? Have you ever wondered about that? Probably at some time you have, yeah. And then I have the guy's name here. I could say his name. I never heard of him before, but my wife knew who he was. Dawson McAllister. Ever heard of him? Some of you have. Here's four things. Am I asking with wrong motives? I'm not doing them in the order he's got. Am I digging into God's word? I would agree with him on that. You know, you should dig into God's word. Have I made anything more important than God? Anybody really want to stand up here this morning (laughs) and tell me there's nothing in your life you've made more important than God? Anybody want to stand up and give us a word of testimony? I didn't think. The the fourth one, have I confessed my sins to God? Unconfessed sins separates us from God so that he won't even hear our prayers. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear. I I didn't check this out. I just, you know, full disclosure, I don't think this is King James, okay? I'm just reading. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities, sins, have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. You know what? That's the verse I just read. Is there something you need to confess to God? Do you know this is brutal stuff? This is, this is, this is like, you know, Christian brutality to to put this on somebody. So, you know, I'm not getting what I want, so obviously there's some unconfessed sin in my life or there's some, you know, I've got something going on and God's not happy with me and I'm out of fellowship. Let me say right here, right now, you are not out of fellowship because you, your fellowship does not depend upon you and the confession of your sins. I have a verse. (laughs) Ephesians chapter 3. You all love Ephesians 3, don't you? Yes. Ephesians 3 is wonderful, is it not? And verse 12 of Ephesians 3 is really the conclusion of Paul's thought that he starts up in chapter 3, verse 1, where he talks about, uh, For I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, anybody here ever heard of the dispensation of the grace of God? We do that booth ministry, which is going to be talked about. I don't know if it was talked about yet or not. That's a great thing, that booth ministry. Our church has been involved in that for four or five years. And i, I got to really say, that is the most exciting ministry I've ever done, is working at that booth at that fair. And there, there are people actually lining up to hear the gospel. They just don't know it. (laughs) So we've got this quiz box, and we've passed out thousands of tracts, hundreds of right division charts. We had 300 last year. I think we passed them all out, the right division charts. And we ask people, have you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God? You know what most people say? Huh? It's kind of like when those guys came, uh, the, the guys in Ephesus, Ephesus, I think it was, that had been baptized with the baptism of John, and Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost? And they said, what? We have never even heard of that. See, that's kind of how most people are about the dispensation of the grace of God. Okay, I say all that to say in verse 12, 
That really is the end of that thought. And he says in verse 12, I'll read verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom this verse is dynamite verse, this verse is wonderful, talking about Christ, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Anybody who uses Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 to beat up on you, you should get away from that person. It is not right for that to be happening, but it goes on all the time. This verse tells me that my access to God, I come boldly with confidence, not fearful that God's going to kick me out or not listen to me or pay attention to me because I don't come like this sniveling little person that I am. I come as Christ. In whom? It's talking about Jesus Christ. My fellowship with God and... He says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. You know how that, by the faith of him. It's not my faithfulness to confess all my sins. How many sins do I commit that I forget or maybe didn't even know were sins? And I'm going to say, I'm going to have someone tell me, are you confessed and up to date? You ever heard that? See, this verse tells me when it talks about the faith of him, that's his faithfulness, his faithfulness to do what he said he would do for me. And it's really not an issue of, you know, am I confessed and and up to date? Am I thinking right about everything? Am I harboring unconfessed sin in my heart or whatever the place, whatever the thing might be? Because the issue is what has Christ done for me and what is my faith resting in as payment for that? And I have access into the very throne room of God as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, because I'm seated with Him in heavenly places and blessed with all spiritual blessings in Him. Wow. See, maybe you get used to hearing that. You should never get used to hearing that. That's exciting stuff. You know, uh, this happens a lot. Family, husband and wife, they've been beaten down by Christianity and all this kind of legalistic stuff, and they come to the grace message, and they just, they're just they so excited, and this is wonderful, and they start going to a grace church, and they bring their kids, Right? So the parents, to the parents, this is the most wonderful thing they've ever heard. And to their kids who go there every week with them, it's just, this is where we go. Oh, ah." you know, you understand? Those kids need to be shocked, you know. And I know it's a personal thing. Everyone's got to have their own faith in these things. They can't rest in anybody else's faith. (coughs) Well, turn back to Colossians. And I'm going to end (coughs) probably on time, looks like. Colossians 4.2. So continue in prayer, watch in the same, and then he ends the verse where he says, with thanksgiving. If you can't be a thankful person, you've got a spiritual problem you need to deal with. Because, you know, this is a big deal, actually. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 again. The next verse, from verse 17, verse 18. Let's start at 16. He says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I can deal with that verse. In everything, give thanks. It is, you know, he prayed that they would know God's will, Christ's will for them. That verse tells you one of the things that it is. It is God's will for you to give thanks in all things. To be thankful for everything. Now, I can deal with that. 
The next verse I have trouble dealing with more than this one. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. The next verse is harder. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 20. So you could kind of, with the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, you could kind of like maybe wiggle your way out from that. Even though it's God's will for you to give thanks and everything, this verse is harder, I think. Thankfulness is such an important thing. You know, in Romans 1, and where it talks about how the, the Gentile world went into this degradation, you know one of the things it says about them? Is they were unthankful. It doesn't matter how much money you have or lack of money. You could be thankful for what you have. Uh, somebody gave me a kid's book recently and wanted to know if I wanted to put it at church. So I read that book. You know what I did with it? I threw it away. There were actually two books I threw away by that same person. They're just kids' books, but it said, God wants you to be thankful for all the good things he gives you. And okay, but this goes beyond that. The other book was about how to ask Jesus into your heart. I threw that one away too. Uh, verse 19, Ephesians 5, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things. See, there's no getting away from that one. The verse is telling you to give thanks for all things. Now, I know that you might not be especially thankful when your car breaks down in the middle of the night on some country road. Then you should be thankful for AAA <laughs> or some such service. It's really a good thing to have, actually. And you might not be thankful at the time, at the moment. That's really, in the whole flow of life, that's a pretty trivial thing. You can make it whatever you want to make it. To, but to be thankful in all things. And the thing is, in, in Romans 8, when it talks about all things work together for good, that's not talking about in this world. Sometimes things aren't good and they don't work out for good, right? That's talking about, well, just look at Romans 8. Romans 8, <clears throat> verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings, this is where all things work for good. I reckon, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Some things in life are not good, and there's no way you can make them good. But in the context of eternity, and this is, this is how the renewed mind, I believe, would think about these things. The renewed mind would look at life in the context and in the setting, not of the immediate circumstance or situation. The renewed mind would take the perspective of looking at it from the eternal point of view. And we know that all things work together for good because in eternity there's glory to be revealed in us that's a better thing than whatever happened happens in your circumstance or situation in life sometimes things go your way sometimes they don't sometimes the thing that you think would be the best thing for you is actually the worst thing for you and if it actually did work that way, you might be, you know, find yourself in bad shape. How many of you, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, okay? How many of you have thought, well, if I won the lottery? Well, you see, I don't actually personally play the lottery, but 
If you do, that's your business, not mine. If you did win, you think that would be a good thing, and in certain ways, yeah, it would be, because then you wouldn't have financial issues. Let me say this. Is God faithful to you if you don't have enough money to make your car payment? Yeah. Now, I hope you do. (laughs) That's a problem. You need to deal with that problem. Put your car in the garage every night. That's how I would deal with it. (laughs) Because if you're behind on your car payment and it's in the driveway, you might wake up one morning and it's gone. (laughs) God is faithful to you whether the repo man gets it or not. God is faithful to you no matter what. (laughs) Something blow up when that starts beeping? God is faithful to you. Period. Bottom line. And it doesn't really exactly... I know this sounds so crass and so cold... It doesn't exactly really matter how that works out. The fact is that God is still faithful. And we're praying. You can pray about anything you want to pray for. Whatever concerns you or is bothering you, it's just what are you expecting God to do? If you're expecting God to drop, you know, four or $500 in your checking account to make the car payment, well, you're probably going to be disappointed. And you're going to say... You're going to write this guy and you're going to say, God's not answering my prayers. You know, why isn't God answering my prayers? But if you don't expect God to do that and it doesn't show up there, well, then, you, you know, then you're not all bent out of shape. Here's my advice about that. Buy a car you can afford. <laughs> Live within your means. Have you bought things? You've got to pay for things you can't afford to pay for? Get rid of your credit card. You can still pray about it. But don't expect God to, you know, zap your checking account. Somebody can zap your checking account, and it's not God. It's still three letters, but it's not God. And I I hope you don't have that problem. (laughs) Pray without ceasing. Continue in prayer with all watching with thanksgiving. Because that really shows something about how spiritual you actually are. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and our position that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we just pray that we would come to the full understanding so that we know and understand that we have access with boldness and confidence, not based on our faithfulness, but based on the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just thank you for that and pray that we would rejoice in it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.